Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. On May 28, 1980, a young woman from Anaheim, California named Dorothy Jean Scott vanished without a trace. This would not be so unusual, since thousands of people disappear every year, but Dorothy was a 32-year-old single mother who left a four-year-old son behind, was a quiet, ordinary woman that her friends said was as dull as a phone book, was religious, didn't date, and spent most all of her time at home. But then there were the phone calls. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. For several months before she vanished, Dorothy Jane Scott was receiving multiple phone calls every day from a stalker. The calls came in at Swinger's Psych and Head Shop where she worked as a secretary, and the man's voice on the other end of the line sounds vaguely familiar to her, but she could never place it. Sometimes he was kind and happy, other times he was angry and suspicious. The caller told Dorothy that he followed her and provided details from her daily life to prove it. The kind-hearted and compassionate young woman was so unnerved that she began taking self-defense classes and even considered buying a handgun. On the evening of May 28, Dorothy dropped off her son Sean at her parents' house and went back into work for a staff meeting. Dorothy noticed that a co-worker, Conrad Bostron, was looking sick during the meeting and saw that he had a red rash on his arm that seemed to be getting worse. She insisted on taking Conrad to the emergency room. Another co-worker, Pam Head, went with them. They were at the hospital for several hours. It turned out that Conrad had an infected spider bite, and once he was released, Pam stayed with him to finish some paperwork while Dorothy went to bring her car around. It was the last time that her friends saw her alive. Pam and Conrad began to worry after the paperwork was completed and Dorothy still wasn't back with the car. They waited outside for more than 20 minutes and were relieved when they saw Dorothy's car coming toward them. But then the car accelerated, made a sharp turn out of the parking lot, and sped away. Pam ran towards the car, waving her arms, wondering what her friend was doing, but the car was gone. Worried about an emergency with Dorothy's son, Pam and Conrad waited for two hours for Dorothy to return. They called her parents, but they had not seen their daughter since she had dropped off Sean hours before. Then they called the police. Several hours later, Dorothy's car was found abandoned and in flames. There was no sign of Dorothy inside the charred vehicle. And then the telephone calls started. 
Days later, the phone rang at Dorothy's parents' house. Her mother Vera answered the call. A man's voice asked, are you related to Dorothy Scott? Vera said that she was. The man replied, I've got her, and then hung up. The police had asked the Scotts not to talk to the media about the case, but after a week with no answers, Dorothy's father Jacob got impatient and contacted the local Santa Ana Register. The story ran, and the next day, editor Pat Riley received his own mysterious phone call. A man was on the line. He said, I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. The caller offered details about what Dorothy was wearing and why she was at the hospital that night to prove his story was genuine. He claimed that Dorothy had called him from the hospital, but Pam Head insisted that was not true. Dorothy had never been out of her sight until she went out to get the car. The police investigation led nowhere. However, over the next four years, Dorothy's parents received a call from her killer every Wednesday afternoon when Vera was home alone. The caller would either ask if Dorothy was home, claim he killed her, or simply stated, I've got her. The police tried to trace the calls, but in those days they never had enough time to do so. The man never stayed on the line long enough. The calls finally stopped in April of 1984 after an evening call that was answered by Jacob Scott. Once a man's voice answered, the killer only called two more times, after the case took another heartbreaking turn. In August 1984, a construction worker found human remains in a rugged area north of Anaheim. Vera identified a turquoise ring and a watch found with the bones as belonging to Dorothy. The watch stopped at 12.30 a.m. May 29, 1980. About a week later, the remains were positively identified as being those of Dorothy Jane Scott. The story of the remains was reported widely in Southern California newspapers and apparently was seen by the killer. There were two more calls to the Scott family home. Each time, the same man's voice asked, is Dorothy home? Of course, the answer was no. Dorothy was never coming home, and her killer, whoever he was, knew it. To this day, the murder of Dorothy Jane Scott remains unsolved. This story begins last fall, 2017, when my family decided to buy and renovate a house that had previously been abandoned for the last 19 years. This house was a quite large two-story farmhouse that had been built in 1871 and hadn't been lived in since the late 1990s. At first, the house looked like something from a modern-day horror movie, with rooms that had collapsed ceilings and holes in the walls and floors, to whole rooms that had been sealed off with plastic wrap for who knows how long. The house from the first time I stepped inside gave me an uneasy feeling, and I felt that something was watching me all the time. We started cleaning out the house and took out all the old garbage and stuff that, well, wasn't needed. The room I chose to make my own was the room that had been closed off for years. From the very start, I felt drawn to that room, and I have no idea why, but that's the room that I always felt the strongest presence. The room was one of the largest rooms with three windows facing different directions, and from the curtains and old room color, it appeared to have been a girl's room. You know that feeling you get when you know someone's watching you? That room always gave that impression. A few weeks into working on the house, we decided to take some photos of it from the outside. After looking at the photos, I swear that from one of the windows in my bedroom seemed to be the image of a little girl with long, dark hair standing and almost staring out the window at us. 
I know for a fact that no one was inside the house at that time, and the girl in this photo looked so real. From that day on, every time I was working in that room, I would actually talk to the air, half expecting something or someone to answer me. To this day, nothing has answered me, but I still feel that something's there. The photo is not the only thing that's weird about the house. In the basement, which is old dirt floor, we found what looked like an old string Raggedy Ann kind of doll and a few other old toys buried down there. Then there's also another room, which is across from my room and had two doors, both of which mysteriously had extra locks on the door frame, which to me made it feel like whoever had that room wanted to keep something out. I don't know if there is any real ghost, but I feel like something is there. And I've asked and searched public records and even the old owners couldn't tell me the history of the house. But if you think about it logically, the house is from the 1800s, and it's not hard to believe that someone could have died there. I've continued to work on my room by repainting it and just basic work, but I still feel her there and I believe I always will. Maybe one day I'll find out the truth about this house, and until then I'll continue to live with my new ghost. I had a job working at a secured military facility out in the remote Utah desert. When I was hired, the man who trained me asked if I believed in ghosts, because if not, I would be before I left the job. He was kind of strange, though, just like the rest of us graveyard shift workers, so I never gave it much thought. He shadowed me for a week, showing me where I was allowed to go, where the restricted areas were, and he introduced me to the occasional worker that we ran into. We worked in a huge warehouse that was divided into seven sections. There were only four of us working the night shift. There was an area that felt really creepy, and I mentioned so. It was in the nicest section of the warehouse, the quality control department, which was well lit and even heated, easily the most comfortable section. My trainer gave me a nervous look and hustled me out of there. Once we got outside, he told me an inspector died by suicide in there. Don't talk about him, though, or else he may show up, he said. He told me if I talked about ghosts, he would PT my butt and recycle me all the way down to janitor, so don't talk about ghosts inside. He then proceeds to tell me about seven deaths that have occurred there, the most gruesome of which was three men killed by an explosion on the fifth floor of the building across the street. Their bodies were found two days later on top of our building. The photographer sent to document the explosion went on our building to take pics and discover them. Two suicides, the inspector having only died seven months before, one man killed for cheating on another man's wife, he tried to make it look like an accident, a heart attack, and the last one was a trespasser on base. He was some UFO guy who snuck on base and was shot by our guards in the tool room. Fast forward a few weeks. After my training, I began settling into my new job, but the stories my trainer had told me stuck with me. I'd always hear weird noises, but I figured as long as I minded my own business, the ghosts wouldn't bother me. Whenever I encountered another worker, we would chat a bit to pass the time. Everyone was friendly enough. One night in the break room, a man came in in full Class A uniform. He paused and glared straight at me. I stood up and introduced myself, figuring he was one of the military guys checking on a project. He never shook my hand. He never said a word. As he glared at me, he simply vanished into thin air. If you were to visit the Bethlehem Royal Hospital circa the 15th century, it would look like a scene out of American Horror Story. 
Bethlehem was the only institution in Europe that handled society's rejects, namely the mentally or criminally ill for the vast majority of European history. It did not, however, treat patients with a kind and affirming hand. Quite the opposite happened. Patients were subjected to horrendous cruelty, experimentation, neglect, and humiliation, all of which was entirely socially acceptable up until the 20th century. The term bedlam, defined as chaos and confusion, was coined as a descriptor for the Bethlehem Asylum during the height of its chaos in the 18th century. Founded in the year 1247, it was the first hospital of its kind in Great Britain. Never before had there been a place for the mentally infirm, disabled, and criminally minded to be adequately locked away from society. While patients came to Bethlehem suffering from complaints such as chronic mania or acute melancholy, people were just as likely to be admitted for crimes such as infanticide, homicide, or even ruffianism. Being admitted to Bedlam, as it was called, didn't necessarily mean a person was well on their way to being rehabilitated, since treatment implied little more than isolation and experiment. If the patient managed to survive the asylum at all, they and their families were typically worse for the wear by the end of their stay. Patients were subjected to treatments such as rotating therapy, wherein they were seated in a chair suspended from the ceiling and spun as much as 100 rotations per minute. The obvious purpose was to induce vomiting, a popular purgative cure for most ailments during this period. Incidentally, the resulting vertigo in these patients actually contributed a large body of research to contemporary vertigo patients. Their dizziness, it seems, was not all for nothing. Beyond social mores of the time, a lack of funding can explain why Bethlehem became Bedlam. The asylum was a poorly funded government institution heavily reliant upon the financial support of a patient's family and private donors. Of course, the vast majority of those who found themselves at Bedlam had not come from wealth or even the middle class. Patients were often poor, uneducated, and had been victimized not only by whatever mental infirmities they possessed, but a society that was repelled by them. In fact, by the 18th century, Bedlam had become less a hospital and more a circus sideshow, and for a pretty straightforward reason freaks made money. People came from all over to see the patients, some even arranging holidays around doing it. Of course, none of them were actually freaks, but since Bedlam was so fiscally reliant upon the money guests would pay to see them, patients were certainly driven to behave as though they were mad. By the mid-1800s, a man named William Hood became physician-in-residence at Bedlam, and wanted to completely turn the institution around. He hoped to create actual rehabilitation programs which would serve the hospital's patients rather than the administrators. The Bedlamites, as they were nicknamed, had been subjected to horrific treatments, both experimental and some downright cruel, and were often desired only for the study of their corpses. Others were simply thrown into a mass grave on Liverpool Street which was only discovered a few years ago. During World War II, Bethlehem Royal Hospital was moved to a more rural location, which was meant to improve the quality of life for patients. The move also helped rid the institution of its horrendous legacy. Though, thanks to the Museum of the Mind archives, we are able to get a glimpse of the haunted faces of Bedlamites. Many of them were photographed upon their admission with a note or two about their diagnosis. One wonders, looking at the photos today, how many of these patients survived Bedlam, and if they did, if any of them were ever truly well again.
Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. I'm just going to get right into it. I never thought I'd share this story. This happened about 25 years ago when I was 18 in 1993. I've lived here in Washington in the Clark County area my whole life except for a time I lived in Utah for three years. My father had been a teacher and in the summertime we'd haul horses at night. And in a little town, Orchards, up in Vancouver, we had about 10 acres up there and we were buddied up to another 20 acres on one side and another 20 acres on the other. So there was about 50 acres around our farm, and we had about 22 horses out there at the time. Well, we were hauling horses in the middle of the night in the summertime, and we were coming home from Afreda, and we started getting toward our area. And again, this was a tiny town, orchards at this time, narrow two-lane road, and we saw this huge glow. At first, my father thought our house was on fire and he started freaking out. My mom was freaking out, and there were two others in the car, myself and a friend of mine. As we got closer, we thought the field was on fire. My dad started screaming that the field was on fire. This was like half a mile away. This is the whole area, and we thought one of our houses is on fire. As we got closer, we pulled into our driveway and our farm goes about 200 yards. The driveway, it was a long driveway, and in the back, we had 22 horses underneath this huge light. And all I can tell you, it was like this huge heat lamp spotlight. My mom started freaking out. My dad was honking the horn. If you know anything about horses, horses just don't sit there and do nothing. All 22 of our horses were standing underneath this light as still as can be. We hadn't cut the field yet, so the grass was a foot high. There was no movement in the grass. My dad just started hauling ass down the gravel driveway to get to the horses. He was honking his horn and the horses wouldn't move. We got out, jumped out, and the next thing we know, and I mean this thing was huge, it took up the entire field, the entire 10 acres. It was enormous. It was over our house. It was over the field, but the light was coming down on our horses. All of a sudden, this thing just… this is the best way I can describe it. It goes up about 150 yards and it starts going at a 45 degree angle and it stops. It stops a little ways up there. The Air Force were flying a lot of F-16s. Still, there were fighter jets all over our house like low flying, low enough to shake our barn and this thing, it was still so bright, it was lighting up the entire farm community at 3 o'clock in the morning. Next thing we know, this thing just went, you know, 45 degrees, right past a plane and gone. I turned to my dad. My dad looked at me and he goes, we won't ever talk about this again. Now that I'm in my 40s, I'm not afraid of my dad anymore, and I don't care what people think. It's something my dad said. We're not going to talk about it. You know what I mean? People will think you're crazy. Lewis asked about the horses, so we went and checked them, and that's the first thing we did. After this thing took off, we went out to check our herd. We pulled the horses in, and their eyes were huge and dilated. You know how when an animal stares into a light and their eyes will dilate really big? So all our horses were like that. And horses, when they stand still, when they're terrified, their muscles will vibrate and 
shake really bad and that's all they did. They didn't run, they just stood out there and their muscles were shaking. We had to go out there, we had to calm the horses down and give them grain. It took a good half hour to get them to stop shaking and then they just started moving around like normal. We thought. We didn't know what the heck had happened out there and to this day I still can't believe it. I'm a teacher, I'm the most practical guy in the world and I still can't believe what I saw to this day. Again, my dad told me we don't talk about this, we don't say anything about it. Like I said, there were fighter jets and helicopters all over our farmland down in orchards for a good hour and a half just doing flybys over and over and over all night. You never think orchards. When I looked at the light, it was almost like looking at a flash burn of a welder. You couldn't look at it, it hurt. And so I was shielding my eyes, kind of looking down at the horses and the grass. Now, if they had any kind of a thruster or an engine, I mean, the grass would have been moving. And when this thing went into the air, the grass was as still as could be. I mean, aside from a light breeze. And this thing was huge. We're talking at least a couple hundred yards across, spanning our entire and our neighbor's acres. I honestly have no idea what that was or what happened that night. When I was in high school, my uncle and I would hunt deer and turkey in eastern Kansas. In 1999, we were bow hunting for deer in a swampy woodland area. We'd been in the same location before and familiar with the layout. Both of us had portable tree stands overlooking the bottom land. We'd been in our stands for about an hour. It was early morning, but I don't remember the time. My uncle was to the right of me, about 50 yards so we could both see anything moving below. I heard splashing from his direction and noticed him waving at me. The splashing was getting louder. I first thought it may be a small herd of deer moving my way. As I looked through the thickets, I noticed something tall and bulky standing beside a tree. I then saw something similar a few feet away from the other figure. I looked over at my uncle. He was crouched down and still. The two figures started to move towards me. Then one worked its way into a clearing and I was able to get a good look. It was definitely a Bigfoot, and it was huge. It was around eight foot tall and covered head to toe in matted, muddy, dark hair. It was reaching into the water and putting whatever it found in its mouth. I didn't see the other creature. It must have moved off in the other direction. I was as still as possible, though I was shaking. This Bigfoot was no more than a hundred feet from me, though I was twelve foot in a tree. I must have watched it for ten minutes or so as it waded through the water, eating whatever it pulled out. It eventually walked away from us toward the woods on the opposite rise. My uncle and I looked at each other but didn't make a sound. I was ready to get out of there, but he remained in his stand holding his hand at me palm out to let me know to hang on. I wasn't even thinking about hunting deer anymore that day. About 15 or 20 minutes had gone. My uncle started moving off his stand. I did the same, dropping the ladder and climbing down. We walked toward each other and agreed to come back for the stands later. In fact, I didn't go back. That afternoon, my dad and grandfather went back with my uncle to look around and retrieve the stands. Both of them believed we saw the Bigfoot. My grandfather said he believes they were eating freshwater mussels and snails. I never went back to that area, though I do still hunt. That was the only time I've ever seen anything like that. I'd be interested to know of other witness sightings in eastern Kansas and western Missouri. I have heard of many stories, but nothing recent. On August 23, 2010, police found the body of a naked man in the bathtub of his flat in Pimlico, London, zipped inside a red North Face bag 
which was padlocked shut from the outside. The key to the padlock was found in the bag, beneath the man's body. This would all be strange enough, but to complicate the mystery, the man in question was Gareth Williams, a Welsh mathematician who was working with the British Secret Intelligence Service, also known as MI6. In other words, he was a spy. Hailing from Anglesey, Wales, Gareth Williams was a true whiz kid, getting a first-class math degree from Bangor University when he was only 17. He subsequently got his PhD from the University of Manchester and went to work for Government Communication Headquarters, or GCHQ, who in turn seconded him out to MI6. Due to the top-secret nature of his work for the Secret Intelligence Service, the investigation of his death had to be handled in a less-than-routine manner. Because the details of his case could not be immediately revealed to the public, or even to all of the police who were involved in the investigation, there are those who still believe that key elements of his death were covered up, falsified, or intentionally lost. Some sort of conspiracy would certainly explain many of the bizarre elements surrounding William's death, including the strange arrangement of his body, the fact that no fingerprints or DNA were found on the bathtub or the bag, and that no drugs or poisons were found in a subsequent toxicology report. Indeed, in 2012, a coroner's inquest determined that it would have been almost impossible for Williams to have locked himself in the bag in question and concluded that his death was unnatural and likely to have been criminally mediated. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough evidence for the inquest to render any more definitive verdict. The coroner's inquest led to a second investigation by the Metropolitan Police Department, which also led nowhere substantial, leading officials to declare that the most probable scenario was that Williams had died alone after accidentally locking himself in the bag, possibly as an act of solo bondage play that ended tragically. While accidentally locking yourself in a bag seems like an absurd conclusion at a glance, there were certainly reasons for the police to have their suspicions. Three years before his death, Gareth Williams had been found by his landlady and her husband, tied to his bed and screaming for help. He told them that he had tied himself to the bed in order to see if he could get loose. Was that the truth, or was something more sinister going on? Perhaps someone else had tied Williams up, someone whose identity he was not free to divulge to his landlady. Or perhaps he really had been practicing his escape artist skills. After all, as a spy, no one ever knows when the skills of an escape might come in handy. Another possibility that was brought up during the inquest was that Williams was interested in bondage. He had apparently spent some time on bondage websites, though the coroner determined that the visits were intermittent and not frequent enough to suggest an active interest in the lifestyle. Still, that, combined with the tying himself to the bed incident, was enough for some people to write off William's death as a sex game gone wrong. The strange case hasn't remained quiet in the years since William's death. In 2015, Boris Karpichkov, a former KGB agent who had defected from Russia, claimed that Williams had been murdered by members of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service by means of an untraceable poison introduced in his ear. According to Karpichkov, the reason for Williams' murder was a failed attempt to recruit the Welsh mathematician into becoming a double agent. In the course of the attempt, Karpichkov said, the Russians discovered that Williams knew the identity of a Russian mole within the British government communications headquarters and killed him in order to keep him from talking. The counter-narrative sounds like something right out of a spy novel, with the double agent and the GCHQ going by the codename Orion, while Karpichkov calls the Russian assassins who did Williams in the cleaners and claims that they used belladonna asinite, and black henbane, according to some sources. 
Karpichkov isn't the only one who suspects that Russia might have been behind William's death. According to a lengthy investigation by BuzzFeed News, several United States intelligence officials have confirmed that Gareth Williams is one of the 14 or more people who may have been killed by Russian assassins on British soil. After former Russian agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were poisoned with a Novichok nerve agent in Salisbury in March of 2018, Colin Sutton, a former Metropolitan Police detective and the senior officer on the scene of William's death, has called for a fresh look into the strange case. Quote, in light of the recent Russian activity in the UK, unquote. Whether yet another investigation of the spy in the bag will shed any new light on the mysterious death of Gareth Williams remains to be seen. But it seems impossible to deny that there are still more questions than answers in this haunting case. On Friday, July 6, 2018, a friend and I were driving out to Pleasant Bay, a small beach area outside of Consecon, Ontario. It was around 8.30 p.m. and the sun was only just beginning to set on the horizon. We figured we still had a good 90 minutes before it got dark, so we got some McDonald's coffee and headed out. The beach is way out in the middle of nowhere, down a lengthy stretch of highway with lots of trees lining both sides of the road and broken up by the occasional farmer's field. About 10 minutes outside of Consecon, while cruising on the Loyalist Parkway, I noticed something in the trees just as we approached a bend in the road. We were moving quite fast, doing about 90, but something caught my eye. A fleeting glimpse of what looked like grayish legs or talons making a ruckus in the trees on the left-hand side of the road. I didn't get much of a look at it, but my friend who was behind the wheel certainly did. As we zoomed by, he craned his neck out the window, trying to get a look at whatever it was. He eventually turned back to me, blurting, ''Holy crap, did you see that bird? That was the biggest effing bird I've ever seen!'' In his usual expletive-filled way, he indicated that the bird he saw had a massive wingspan, was brownish in color, and was as big or bigger than the car slightly ahead of us on the road. When I asked him what it was doing, he told me that it was trying to jump from one branch to another with some difficulty. It was so big the branches couldn't bear its weight. I have to wonder if it was looking for roadkill and the passing cars, us and the car ahead of us, maybe spooked it. My friend is accustomed to seeing turkey vultures and other large birds as he often accompanies his father back north on hunting trips, but this was bigger than anything he had ever seen before. With regards to why we didn't turn around to get a picture or get a better look, it just honestly didn't occur to us at the time. It was just something odd that we passed on the road and we wanted to get to the beach and have a swim before it got too dark. It should be noted that my friend has not even a remote interest in the paranormal or cryptozoology as he feels it's all a bunch of foolishness. He is completely oblivious to all the recent giant bird and winged humanoid sightings being reported around the world, so I found it funny that he was the one who saw it. While it was probably nothing, I figured I'd send this along to you, as I know you collect these types of weird reports. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next, but one thing is sure. When the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King 
Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. John Babacom Lee was sentenced to be hanged for murder. Executions in late 19th century England were grisly affairs. The preferred method was by hanging, and often a prisoner could twist on the rope for 30 minutes or so before death finally came. All of the hangings at the time were grimly successful. Except for one. On February 23, 1885, 19-year-old John Babacom Lee was brought to the gallows for the murder of his employer, Ellen Keese. His trial was swift, but the evidence was fairly circumstantial. Keese had been found stabbed to death in the pantry of her estate house, and Lee's room was off the pantry, and the knife was allegedly one of his own. There were no eyewitnesses, but John Babacom Lee was condemned to death by the judge anyway. On that February day, Lee was led to the gallows, and his arms and legs were bound after he was standing on the trap door. John Babacom Lee continued to maintain his innocence. The chaplain spoke to Lee, and then the executioner pulled the lever. Nothing happened. He pulled the lever again. Still nothing. John Babacom Lee remained standing as warders pounded on the trap door with their feet. After six minutes, Lee, still bound, was carried off the trap door. The bolts were checked, and some of the wood around the edges of the trap door was shaved down a bit. A heavy weight was placed on the trap door, and the lever was pulled and everything worked fine. The chaplain again spoke to John Babacom Lee, and then Lee was placed on the trap door and the lever was pulled again. But the trap door failed to open. Once again, John Babacom Lee was removed and a carpenter worked frantically to assure that the trap door was in working order. Again, it was tested successfully. Lee was lifted back onto the gallows for the third time. The chaplain later said, The lever was pulled again and again, but when I turned my eyes to the scaffold, I saw the poor convict standing upon the drop as I had seen him twice before. I refused to stay longer. Clearly frustrated, John Babacom Lee was removed from the gallows, his ropes were removed, and he was taken back to a jail cell. Soon after, he was granted a reprieve by Home Secretary Sir William Harcourt. Was the trap door faulty? It seemed to work perfectly for other prisoners. Or was it divine providence that prevented Lee's death sentence from going through? We will likely never know this side of eternity. John Babacom Lee served 22 years in prison, was released, and then moved to America, where he died in 1933. Charlie Brandt always seemed like a normal guy, until one bloody night in September 2004. At the time, Hurricane Ivan was barreling toward the Florida Keys, where the 47-year-old Brandt lived with his wife, Terry, age 46. They evacuated their home on Big Pine Key on September 2nd to stay with their niece, 37-year-old Michelle Jones, in Orlando. Michelle was close to Terry, her maternal aunt, and was excited to welcome her and her husband as house guests. Michelle was likewise close with her mother, Mary Lou, with whom she spoke on the phone almost every day. When Michelle stopped answering her phone after the night of September 13th, Mary Lou grew concerned and asked Michelle's friend, Debbie Knight, to go to the house and check on things. When Knight arrived, the front door was locked and there was no answer, so she made her way to the garage. There was a garage door with almost all glass so you could see in, Knight recalled. I was in shock. There, inside the garage, Charlie Brandt was hanging from the rafters. 
he had committed suicide, authorities would later learn. But Charlie Brandt's death was just one of the horrible deaths that had happened inside that house. When authorities arrived at the house, they found a scene that looked like something out of a slasher movie. Charlie Brandt had hung himself with a bedsheet. Terry's body was on the couch inside. She had been stabbed seven times in the chest. Michelle's body was in her bedroom. She had been decapitated, her head placed next to her body, and someone had removed her heart. It was just a nice home, lead investigator Rob Hemmer recalled. All of those nice decorations and the aroma of her home was masked by death, the smell of death. Yet with all this bloodshed, there were no signs of a struggle or forced entry, and the house was locked from the inside. Thus, with two people killed and one having killed himself, authorities quickly determined that Charlie Brandt had killed his wife and niece before committing suicide. But no one seemed to expect anything like this from Charlie Brandt. Mary Lou said of her brother-in-law, whom she'd known for 17 years, when they described what had happened to Michelle, it was even beyond description. Likewise, Lisa Emmons, one of Michelle's best friends, couldn't believe it herself. She said he was just very quiet and reserved. He would just sit back and observe. Michelle and I used to call him eccentric. Not only did everyone find Charlie Brandt nice and agreeable, they all felt like he and Terry had the perfect marriage. The inseparable pair did everything together – fishing and boating near their home, traveling and so on. No one had any explanation for Charlie Brandt's behavior. Then his older sister came forward. Angela Brandt was two years older than Charlie, and she harbored a dark secret from their Indiana childhood that no one knew about until she told the story. In an interrogation with Rob Hemmert, Angela cried before stealing her nerves and telling her story. What you are about to hear is the actual audio from that interview. I haven't told this story. I can't remember when. This is Investigator Rob Hemmert with the Seminole County Sheriff's Office. The person being interviewed is Angela, and the last name is Brant. That's all right. I'm all right. It was January 3rd, 1971. Charlie was 13? Yes. And Angela, you were how old? 15. 15. Tell me again what took place and what was going on. 9, 10 p.m. Okay. We um, had just gotten a color TV. Right. So we were all sitting around watching the FBI, you know, F and Zimbalist Jr. and all that. Okay. Um, the FBI was over. We went upstairs. I went and got in bed to read my book like I always did before. I went to sleep. Okay. My mom ran a bath and read Time magazine. My dad was shaving. Okay. So you're you're in your bed reading, and what happens next? I heard loud noises, which I perceived to be firecrackers. Okay. For the simple reason, not that that makes any sense. That's all right. But I mean, you know, I sure. just, what other loud noises is there? Popping. Yeah, just a really loud, loud noise, and I just like I said, I just thought it was firecrackers, so I started pulling the covers back to see why on earth, you know, there was all this noise going on. But then I heard my father yell, um, Charlie, don't, or Charlie, stop. And my mom was just screaming. And the last thing she ever, the last thing I ever heard my mom say was Angela call the police. So what happened after that? So um, I, as I said, I was removing the covers from my bed and getting out of the bed. And all this took place in split seconds. Okay. I mean, it, we couldn't. This has got to be less than a minute, I would think, okay? And I get up, and as I'm getting up, he comes into my room. Charlie. Charlie. Okay. Uh, brandishing the gun, a gun. I didn't even realize what it really was, I mean, until he aimed it at me, and he pulled the trigger. Okay, so you hear it click. I, and I was going to say, and, it, and it, I could hear it click. Okay. And uh, uh, I guess when he realized the gun didn't have any more bullets, that must be what he threw it on the floor. And as I said, I was lucid enough to kick it under the bed. I didn't know if it had any bullets in it or not. I don't even know what was going on. Right. And then an, a physical altercation ensued. I imagine, I think, he struck me. I do. I think he, because I had blood and just bruises, and I fought back. This is the only physical altercation I've ever been in in my entire life. Okay. Okay. And I guess I won because I'm here to tell about it. I don't right. know. Right. 
And um, I just still, I, my brain, I remember I was only 15, my brain was trying to assimilate what was going on, and I was trying to get away from him at the same time. He was very strong. The next thing I know that I can remember is I was laying flat on my back. My bed was right here. On the bed? This, no, on, on the, the floor. floor. Okay. Probably knocked me to the floor. I don't know. Okay. And he was sitting on me, and he was strangling me. Okay. Okay. I was drifting in and out. I don't think that I got him off of me physically. All right. I remember, the way I remember it is, I saw the weird look on his face, the madness, the, the glazed over look. Okay. I saw it disappear. He just looked more like himself and he said, what am I doing? Or what have I done? And I remember perfectly saying, I don't know, but I think you shot dad. Because I heard my dad yelling, Charlie, don't do that, or Charlie, stop. And he said, oh, I did, or whatever. I said, I don't know, but get off of me so we can figure it out, okay? And he did, he got off of me. My next step, I was trying to get out of the house. He goes, so you're not gonna leave me, are you? Of course I said no. Sorry. No, I would run out the door. And I did, as soon as I thought he was far enough away. I ran. Have you ever seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. I saw it once in my life. I could never watch it again. You know the girl screaming? Yeah. The way she ran screaming? That was me. I was just a little girl. I was running through the snow in my bloody nightgown, torn, just screaming. I got to the first house right across the street. I didn't knock on the door. I turned the knob and it was locked. And then I ran to the next house, and by the time I got to the next house, my brother had apparently come down the steps. He was outside. And all my life, I've heard him screaming after me, Angie, you promised you wouldn't leave me. You promised you wouldn't leave me. But I did. Some of the interview may have been difficult to hear, so here are the high points. It was January 3rd, 1971, at 9 or 10 p.m., Angela said. We had just gotten a color TV. We were all sitting around watching the FBI with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. After the TV show was over, I went and got in bed to read my book like I always did before I went to sleep. Meanwhile, Angela and Charlie's pregnant mom, Ilsa, was drawing a bath and their dad, Herbert, was shaving. Then Angela heard loud noises so loud that she thought they were firecrackers. Then I heard my father yell, Charlie, don't, or Charlie, stop, and my mom was just screaming. The last thing I heard my mom say was, Angela, call the police. Charlie, 13 at the time, then came into Angela's room holding the gun. He aimed it at her and pulled the trigger, but all she heard was a click. The gun was out of bullets. Charlie and Angela then began to fight and he started to strangle his sister, which was when she noticed the glazed look in his eyes. That terrifying look disappeared after a moment, and Charlie, as if emerging from a trance, asked, what am I doing? What he had just done was walk into his parents' bathroom, shoot his father once in the back, and then shoot his mother several times, leaving him wounded and killing her. At the hospital in Fort Wayne, just after the incident, Herbert said he had no idea why his son would do this. At the time he shot his parents, Charlie Brandt seemed like a normal kid. He did well in school and showed no signs of underlying psychological stress. The courts, which couldn't charge him with any criminal offense given his age, ordered that he undergo many psychiatric evaluations and even spent more than a year in a psychiatric hospital before Herbert secured his release. But none of the psychiatrists ever found any mental illness or any explanation at all as to why he had shot his family. The records were sealed because of Charlie's young age and Herbert told his other children to keep things quiet and moved the family to Florida. They buried the incident and put it behind them. Anyone who knew the secret never told, and Charlie seemed fine afterward. But it seems he had been harboring dark urges all along. After he killed his wife and niece in 2004, authorities investigated Charlie's house on Big Pine Key. Inside, they found a medical poster 
displaying the female anatomy. There were also medical books and anatomy books, as well as a newspaper clipping that showed a human heart, all of which recalled some of the ways in which Charlie had mutilated Michelle's body. Searches of his internet history revealed websites focused on necrophilia and violence against women. They also found lots of Victoria's secret catalogs, which proved especially troubling after they learned that Victoria's secret is the nickname Charlie had given to Michelle. Knowing what he did to Michelle and then finding those things, Hemmert said, it all started to make sense. Investigators believed that Charlie had become infatuated with Michelle and that his desires had taken a murderous turn. Hemmert, for one, believes that Charlie Brandt had always had these kinds of deadly desires and that he was probably a serial killer. It's just that his other crimes never came to light. For example, authorities believe that he may have been responsible for at least two other murders, including one in 1989 and another in 1995. Both murders involved mutilations of women in a similar method to Michelle's murder. But no matter how many people Charlie Brandt may have killed, he always seemed normal, and even the psychiatrists were always fooled. Perhaps if they'd seen the truth about Charlie way back in 1971, Terry and Michelle would still be alive today. There's a canal near me that's only accessible by foot or bike because it's a protected area for mangrove tree saplings. To get there, I have to walk or ride a mile, but it's worth it as the canal has some of the best fishing in the area. One morning, I drove my truck there. It was around 6 a.m., and though the sun hadn't risen, I could see a glow on the horizon. I loaded my gear on my modified fishing bike and took off down a dirt road. About three-quarters of the way down, I saw the intrusion dam control tower, which was surrounded by a fence. I also noticed what I thought was a large white plastic bag hanging from the top of the fence. I stopped my bike and grumbled about idiots who litter. I started to pedal my bike towards the garbage bag and that's when things got freaky. The bag looked like it was dancing. Wind, right? That's what I thought. I stopped my bike again to take a better look. I saw this garbage bag dancing on the fence, left to right, back to front, right to left, and back again. It then moved over the top of the control tower and hovered, still dancing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and thought the bag was tangled on fishing line or something. I started pedaling closer, and when I got 40 yards away, this garbage bag jumped off the roof of the control tower and took on the shape of a person. I could see the head, the shoulders, an arm, and the legs. I kept pedaling, but it just vanished when I got near. When I reached the tower, there was no garbage bag. Nothing. Not even a fishing line draped on the fencing. I didn't say anything to anyone for three months until I went back to the spot. I then asked the regulars if they'd ever seen anything weird there before. One of them told me that back in the 80s, a jealous boyfriend killed the guy he caught fooling around with his girlfriend during a party. I began to wonder if I'd seen the girl's dancing ghost. After a little digging, I learned that the area used to be a hot spot for bad deeds. I heard the murder story more than three times from some of the old-timers. Wow. I still think about it and wonder. I've gone back several times over the last two years, prepped with a camera, but I've seen nothing but a raccoon and a few iguanas here and there. Will I ever see the girl again? Or was it truly her last dance? No matter the time of day or season, 
Sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Ouija boards, also called spirit boards or talking boards, have been a part of various cultures long before the introduction of the game in the 19th century. Ouija, in fact, is the name of the game invented by Elijah Bond. Authentic Ouija boards are known to practitioners as the aforementioned spirit or talking boards. Regardless, these panels all share characteristics. The board itself has each letter of the alphabet dictated as well as the numbers 0 through 9. And then, whether or not it is inscribed with hello, goodbye, or other full words depends on the creator of the board itself. Each board has a planchette, an essential piece in the ritual. It is the planchette which the people choosing to communicate place their hands upon in the hopes that the spirit will move it to create a message. Despite the lengthy history of talking boards, Modern scientists are highly invested in disproving their use. One of the prominent theories is called the ideomotor effect. This effect can occur in two different ways – either someone intentionally moves his or herself to jostle the table, or the audience accidentally moves the table through subconscious muscular twitches. When paired with a strong desire for a supernatural effect, it's easy for spirit board users to believe the spirits are behind the movements. In essence, the ideomotor effect is most effective when the participants have a strong source of faith in the board. The ideomotor effect is best exemplified in a parlor trick called table tilting. This practice is precisely what it sounds like – the table shifted and moved, thereby allowing the pointer to shift and move as well. This could be a simple actual tilting by a certain person or party, or a more athletic affair. Popular in the Victorian era, when the supernatural and occult were of intrigue to the rich and poor alike, table tilting consisted of the table jerking violently in which the sitters would find themselves chasing around the room trying to keep up with the table. Interestingly, though this practice did prove the falseness of these spiritual claims, experiments revealed it was caused by the aforementioned accidental movements of muscular twitches by the participants. Historically, talking boards find their beginnings in the Chinese Lusong dynasty, the 5th century AD, and was popularized later in a subsequent Song dynasty, the 10th through 13th centuries AD. Called planchette writing, these boards were similarly used to communicate with the deceased. However, it was believed to be a form of necromancy rather than a mere instrument akin to a telephone. In Fu Qi, as it was called in China, the writing was created through a sieve to which was attached a short stick. It was held generally by two persons at either side to trace characters on sand or ashes. The characters were supposed to have been produced by the gods. These historical facts are pertinent to the study of talking boards as it reveals the extensive culture surrounding the practice. In the present day, spirit boards continue to be known as a form of telephoning between the worlds of the living and the world of the dead. The board itself has retained the general template of the earlier 19th century patented models, i.e. Bond's game. The modern-day Ouija is not all fun and games, and in one particular case, 
its use had a very serious outcome. A convicted double murderer won the right to a retrial on the basis that four of the jury had used a Ouija board the night before finding him guilty. Stephen Young of Pembury, England, a 35-year-old insurance broker, was given a life sentence in March 2017 for murdering the newlywed couple Harry and Nicola Fuller at their cottage in Wathurst, East Sussex. However, he was given a retrial after four jury members disclosed that the night before returning their verdicts, they had used a Ouija board to contact the spirit of murder victim Harry Fuller, who they believe told them to vote guilty. While talking boards have become less seriously valued among participants today, it does remain an occasional game or, more regularly, a daring challenge. For all the experiments science has performed, few things are more powerful than the beliefs of the mind. One of the low points in the history of spiritualism involves the career of a British medium named Helen Duncan. Some continue to maintain to this day that she was a martyr to the movement, but most see her as one of the frauds that helped to give spiritualism a bad name. Helen Duncan was born in Scotland in 1898, married at the age of 20, and began to develop psychic talents that were much in demand by the 1930s and 40s. She traveled the country during this period and held seances in private homes and spiritualist churches. She convinced thousands of people that the dead could return in various forms, but most often through ectoplasm, that slimy white substance said to be manifested by spirits. In reality, Helen's ectoplasm was found to be nothing more than a mixture of paper, cloth, egg white, and surgical gauze. She was able to regurgitate the substances on demand. Any lingering doubts about this were dispelled by the medium's husband, who gave an interview late in life that admitted he had seen his wife swallowing various things before her seances. In addition to her ectoplasmic forms, Duncan also worked with spirit guides, one in particular was a child named Peggy, who played an important role during the seances. However, in 1933, at a sitting in Edinburgh, a policeman grabbed at Peggy as she passed by her and discovered that the ghostly girl was actually a torn piece of white underwear. Duncan was arrested, charged with fraud, and fined 10 pounds. Less than two months later, though, she was back at work. Undaunted by her exposure, Duncan proceeded to give a series of test sittings for the National Laboratory of Physical Research, under the direction of its founder, Harry Price. Price had already exposed a number of fraudulent mediums, but was not a debunker of what he considered to be genuine. He was of the opinion that some mediums, including D.D. Holm and Eusapia Palladino, had occasionally managed to produce genuine mental and physical phenomena. Price was not forced to classify Helen Duncan as one of these exceptional cases, though. Photographs taken during her sessions revealed that the ectoplasm she produced was a length of cheesecloth, whose bound edges, texture, and creases were clearly visible. None of her exposures made any difference to Helen's public. Outside of the laboratories, her fame continued to grow and sitters continued to insist that they recognized departed friends and loved ones in the ectoplasmic faces that she materialized. During World War II, her mediumistic powers were much in demand by relatives of those who had died in the service. She held a number of seances in Portsmouth, Hampshire, the home port of the Royal Navy, and one of these, held on January 19, 1944, was raided by the police. A plainclothes policeman who was present blew a whistle to give a signal and other officers burst in. A grab was made for the ectoplasm issuing from the medium, and the seance was abruptly brought to an end. Although nothing incriminating was found, Duncan, along with three others who arranged the seance, Ernest and Elizabeth Homer and Francis Brown, 
was taken to the Portsmouth Magistrates Court and arraigned on charges of conspiracy. At the preliminary hearing, the court was told how Lt. R. H. Worth of the Royal Navy had attended one of Duncan's seances and suspected fraud. He bought two tickets for 25 shillings each for the night of January 19th and took a policeman named Cross with him. Cross grabbed the ectoplasm that floated past him, which he believed was a piece of white sheet, although no sheet was found when the seance was raided, but he was unable to hang on to it. After the hearing, bail was refused, and as a result, Duncan was remanded to Holloway Prison in London for four days before the case was resumed in Portsmouth. The prosecution seemed to be unsure of what to charge the mediums with. On their first appearance at Portsmouth, they were charged under the Vagrancy Act of 1824, but the charge was then amended to one of conspiracy. When the case was eventually transferred to the Central Criminal Courts, the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was cited. Under this ancient act, the defendants were accused of pretending to exercise or use a kind of conjuration that, through the agency of Helen Duncan, spirits of deceased persons should appear to be present. Other charges were brought under the Larceny Act, which was more accurate, and they were accused of taking money by falsely pretending they were in a position to bring about appearances of the spirits of deceased persons. Needless to say, the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was hopelessly outdated, regardless of the guilt or innocence of the defendant. Spiritualists were dismayed by the use of the act to bring about prosecution of the famous medium. They believed that she would be found guilty whether or not her powers were genuine. They were angry because they believed that Duncan was an authentic medium and was being persecuted for her genuine gifts. The prosecution, however, clearly believed that Duncan was a fraud, which was why they charged her with larceny. The use of the Witchcraft Act remained a bit of an enigma, but it certainly gained the trial a lot of publicity. The trial took place in late winter of 1944 and lasted for seven days. Numerous witnesses testified to events they had seen at Duncan's seances. One of them, Kathleen McNeil, claimed that she had attended a seance where her sister had appeared. This sister had died just a few hours before, after an operation, and news of her death could not have been known to Duncan at the time. At another seance, McNeil claimed that her father strode out of the spirit cabinet, looking just as he had when he was alive. Two journalists, H. Swaffer and J. W. Harries, were also called by the defense. The flamboyant Swaffer told the court that not only was ectoplasm real, it could not have been regurgitated by the medium. That was ridiculous, he stated. Harry's claimed that he had seen Sir Arthur Conan Doyle materialize at one of Duncan's seances. He noted the author's rounded features and mustache and recognized his voice, he said. One has to think that Sir Arthur, despite his great belief in the legitimacy of spiritualism, would have been embarrassed to appear at such a shoddy affair as Duncan was offering. The prosecution had to make little effort to convince the jury that Duncan was a fraud. They made liberal use of photographs taken at Duncan's seances, showing blatantly fake ectoplasm emerging from the medium's mouth and nose. One particular favorite was a photo of the spirit child, Peggy, slithering out of Duncan's nostrils. In the photo, the ectoplasm boasted a face that was obviously that of a child's doll. Prosecuting counsel John Maud produced a long piece of butter muslin and referred to the report by Harry Price, who stated that he believed Duncan swallowed the material and then regurgitated it. The jury seemed convinced that she was a fraud. At the start of the trial, the defense offered the jury an actual demonstration of Duncan's mediumship but the judge declined the offer and stated that perhaps Mrs. Duncan should testify as a witness instead. The defense replied, however, that Helen could not testify, as she was in a trance during the seances and unable to discuss what transpired. On the final day, the judge changed his mind and asked the jury if they wanted to see Helen Duncan perform. After a couple of minutes of discussion, they declined the offer. It took just 25 minutes for the jury to return their verdict. 
they found the four defendants guilty of conspiracy to disregard the Witchcraft Act. They were discharged from giving verdicts on the other counts. The judge deferred pronouncing sentence until after the weekend, but when the court did reconvene, he stated that the verdict had not been concerned with whether genuine manifestations of the kind are possible. This court has nothing to do with such abstract questions, he said. The jury has found this to be a case of plain dishonesty. He sentenced Duncan to serve nine months in prison, and the medium was led away, moaning and crying. Of the other defendants, Mrs. Brown was given four months. She had previous convictions for larceny and shoplifting, and the Homers were each given a small fine and placed on probation for the next two years. Helen Duncan served her sentence at Holloway Prison. The spiritualism movement, shocked by the verdict, called for a change in the law to prevent such prosecutions in the future. They felt that Duncan had been unfairly treated, but they did cool their enthusiasm for her after the trial. Public perception was that a fraud had been exposed and officials in the movement decided to put some distance between themselves and the medium. When she was released from prison on September 22, 1944, Duncan announced that she was retiring from seances. But thanks to the large number of faithful followers that she still had, she soon changed her mind. She continued to offer private seances for years afterward. In 1951, the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was finally repealed and replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Helen Duncan's trial had certainly prompted this change in the law, but hopes from the spiritualists that they would no longer be subjected to police harassment were short-lived. In November 1956, police raided a seance taking place in Nottingham. They grabbed the medium, searched her, and photographed her. They shouted that they were looking for beards, a mask, and a shroud but found nothing. The medium conducting the seance? Helen Duncan. Duncan almost immediately became ill after that raid, possibly from shock, and died five weeks later. The doctors listed the cause of death as diabetes and heart failure, but a certain segment of the spiritualist worth thought otherwise. Some complained of police brutality and even murder mostly because the medium had been interrupted during a trance, which all agreed could be extremely dangerous. Even today, Helen Duncan is still seen by some as a martyr to the cause of spiritualism, a victim of the world's intolerance. To most, though, she is seen as another fraudulent medium that, unlike most in the same circumstances, actually got her day in court. Those who point to the egg white and muslin ectoplasm, the phony photographs and the torn underwear spirit guides would say that, in this case, justice prevailed. I've always believed in ghosts, but I've also tempered my belief with a healthy dose of skepticism. I'm not afraid to call bullocks. I've been ghost hunting with friends before and while they experienced hair-raising, pinching, electricity over the skin feelings, and even visual manifestations, I experienced nothing, save for my ability to use dowsing rods and pendulums. In short, I could be in a room full of ghosts and not feel a thing. My experience at college was different. It wasn't anything frightening, it was far more playful and humorous. I graduated from Ohio Wesleyan University in historic Delaware, Ohio in 2001. During my junior year, I lived in Stuyvesant Hall. Stoy opened in 1931, and it's the oldest operating dorm on campus. Naturally, it comes with some ghost lore. According to one campus legend, the dorm was once a hospital-slash-insane asylum. This is completely false. It has only served as a dorm. The other story I heard about Stuyvesant is one that plays out almost exactly like a well-known urban legend. You know, the one where a roommate returns home without turning on any lights. In the morning, she wakes to find her roommate dead and aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light, scrawled in blood on the wall. No students can tolerate the room, so the dean stays in the room overnight to prove them foolish 
and ends up bricking over the door so no one can ever enter the cursed room again. Blah, blah, blah. I called bullocks on that. I had heard that urban legend in middle school. However, in a basement hallway of Stoy, there are a few student rooms, a laundry room and the boiler room. Right next to the boiler room is a former student room which has been bricked up. You can look through the hole left by the missing doorknob and see the bricks. A funny coincidence, I thought. The rooms there are set up with double occupancy rooms separated by a shared bathroom. The room on the other side of my bathroom was directly above the sealed room. My room was above the boiler room. The rooms aren't soundproofed by any means, but you can tell the difference between a sound in the room with you and a sound separated by a wall. I would sit at my desk and watch TV with the bunk beds about six inches from the back of my head. After about a month, I began to notice the bed springs creaking as I sat alone in the room. The beds are old, and they creak when any pressure is applied to the mattress. You can hear them creaking in neighboring rooms. This creaking was directly behind me on our bunk beds. I wasn't touching the beds in any way. They shouldn't have made any noise. Yet there I sat with my roommate's lower bunk creaking like someone was bouncing or moving around on the mattress. I'm glad I had the top bunk. It didn't scare me. I was more amused than anything. It was a daily thing. I told my roommate about it since it was her bunk being occupied by something unseen. She also thought it was funny and was even glad it was her bunk that was being jumped on by our ghost. My roommate didn't spend much time in the room alone, and when she did, she sat on her bed with music on. I don't recall her experiencing the noise. One day I was trying to study for a test, and the creaking springs six inches behind me was just too much. I yelled, get the hell off my bed! The noise stopped and didn't start up again. The next day, I didn't hear it, nor the next day or the next. I actually began to feel guilty. Whatever it was making itself comfortable on the bottom bunk had gone away. The following day, before my roommate returned from class, I stood in the room and told whatever it was that it could come back as long as it didn't use the bed as a trampoline. The following day, as I sat at my desk, the creaking mattress made its familiar noise. It continued the creaking until we moved out at the end of the year. I made sure to say goodbye. Ghost or not, I have no explanation for it. I know the sound wasn't coming from another room. The girl on the other side of the bathroom wasn't well acquainted with us, so I never knew if she experienced anything. It was just a fun, weird little thing that happened that one year and never happened again in any of the dorms in which I lived. Make of it what you will. It was the only time I experienced anything personally that I couldn't explain. The lovers who became known as the Sunset Strip Killers were both regulars in the seedy Los Angeles bar scene of the early 1980s. It was in these dive bars that Doug Clark gave himself the nickname the King of the One Night Stand. Clark was an aimless drifter who worked menial jobs around Southern California before he decided to dedicate his life to something he felt he could excel at – murder. Doug Clark met his accomplice, Carol Bundy, no relation to Ted, at a bar they both frequented called Little Nashville in 1980. Bundy also harbored a dark secret. She had the same dark, violent sexual impulses as Doug Clark. The two soon moved in together and embarked on a murder rampage that shocked Los Angeles. After the two started living together, Clark began to bring prostitutes home for group sex. Soon enough, however, Clark grew unsatisfied, and he began to tell Bundy how what he really wanted was to murder a woman during sex. Clark's talk soon turned into action. In June 1980, he brought home two young runaways, 15-year-old Gina Durano 
and 16-year-old Cynthia Chandler. Clark engaged in sexual relations with the two young women before he shot and killed them. Once they were dead, he raped their corpses. Clark then dumped Nerano and Chandler's bodies on the side of the freeway where they were discovered the following day. Three days after Nerano and Chandler were killed, the body of another young runaway female was found dead in the San Fernando Valley. The police estimated she'd been dead for three weeks, which likely made her Clark's first murder victim. Less than two weeks later, Clark murdered two more women, shooting them in the head and dumping their bodies. This time, Clark took a twisted trophy. He decapitated one of the women and brought her head home to store in his freezer. Bundy put makeup on the severed head, and Clark had sex with it before the head was put into a cardboard box and dumped in an alley. The murders began to haunt Carol Bundy, and she decided to confide in a friend. Bundy met with an ex-boyfriend named John Murray, who sometimes sang country-western music at Little Nashville, the bar where she had met Doug Clark. Murray was understandably shocked by Bundy's confession, and he told his ex-girlfriend that he believed it would be a good idea to notify the police. Bundy panicked. As much as she was disturbed by the crimes she had helped Doug Clark commit, she couldn't go so far as to turn him and herself into the authorities. Bundy spent more time with Murray and attempted to seduce him, eventually convincing Murray to have sex with her in his van. Once inside the van, Bundy shot and killed Murray and then decapitated him. The murder of John Murray made Carol Bundy even more paranoid and distraught. A couple of days after she killed her ex-boyfriend, she confessed the murder to co-workers, who in turn alerted the police. Bundy immediately gave the police details of all the murders she and Doug Clark had committed over the course of several months throughout 1980. Clark was charged with six murders, and Bundy was charged with two. Clark tried to proclaim his innocence during his trial, but the jury had none of it. Doug Clark was sentenced to death, and today he still sits on California's death row. Carol Bundy was sentenced to life in prison for her role in the gruesome string of murders. She died in prison in December 2003 at the age of 61. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.